Welcome to Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, where we talk about gospel insights through great stories and help you find entertainment that is both true and beautiful. I'm your host, Carl Cranny. I have a PhD in religion, and I like to write about the intersection of religious things and pop culture. And with me today is my co-host, Liz Busby. Liz, hello. Hello. I am a writer of science fiction and fantasy and a reviewer of books. And today we have two guests joining us, uh, repeat offenders, both of them. Uh, Nathaniel Givens, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Nathaniel Givens. Um, I write about religion, science, politics, and society for a wide variety of venues, uh, like Public Square Magazine, uh, the forthcoming Radiant from Faith Matters, or a couple. Um, and my first book, Into the Headwinds, co-authored with my father, Terrell, uh, comes out from Erdman's on October 18th. All right. And Ben, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Ben Piccini, and I am faculty up at BYU-Idaho. I teach teachers, uh, and uh, I like uh, all of the people here, uh, mostly. And uh, I enjoyed, I actually really enjoyed the movie, but mostly it's like, these are my friends. I want to hang out and have fun. So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much my claim here. Okay, for a second there, I thought you were saying, I, I work at BYU-Idaho, and I like the people here, mostly. And I was like, do tell me about your coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I quite like all of the people here at BYU Idaho. I mean, sorry, I, that was unclear. But no, of the group of the four of us, I also like most of the people here. Just in case I'm not being clear about that. Just too. not me. Like, <laughs> just clear the air. Like, I'm the offender. Oh boy. All right. Well, welcome to our episode today. We'll be talking about the Adam Project, a Netflix original movie released in 2021. Uh, Sean Levy is directing and. Ryan Reynolds is the main character, a collaboration that worked really well with uh, Free Guy, who we've talked about before. Uh, and the story centers around Adam Reed, a time traveler who teams up with his younger self, trying to repair the broken timeline. But first, we're going to get into our best books segment, where we recommend something we've been reading or watching or enjoying in some way. Uh, I, given the subject of time travel and things like that, want to recommend uh, a book that's an oldie uh, in some ways, but a goodie, Past Watch by Orson Scott Card, where the future society that has ruined the Earth has built machines to peer back into the past, and they realize that the timeline they are living in has already been manipulated and have to sort of decide as a society, since they've ruined the planet so much, how could they go back and fix the timeline and what changes would they make? And uh, it centers a lot around uh, changing the interaction between Christopher Columbus and the Native Americans. And, and it's just a, a really interesting sort of society level wide conversation, the way uh, the Adam Project is more of a personal take on on timelines and fixing uh, mistakes that have been made through time travel. So that's one that I recommend. <clears throat> Uh, Liz, what do you got for us this uh, this episode? Well, I saw your recommendation, and so I decided to also go with a time travel recommendation. Um, it's actually a collection of short stories called Down the Arches of the Years by Lee Allred, who is also an LDS writer. Um, particularly, there's one story in there called Nice Time Stream You's Got Here, um, shame if something was to happen to it and it is great I wish I had thought of the idea of gangster time time travel uh, it's it's pretty fun and the other stories in there are really interesting as well um, Lee Allred has a very unique uh, genre that's all his own like steampunk alternate history with uh, Lovecraftian horror thrown in there um, several of the stories in there are linked in a shared universe that he calls um, Clockwork Deseret, where there's um, steampunk Utah and they use magic to fight Cthulhu and they go all around the world. He's developed magic systems around different um, folk magic in Japan, in England, in France, and all these international organizations banding together to fight Cthulhu like monsters that are intent on destroying humanity. Uh, it's really fun. So that was Down the Arches of the Years by Lee Allred. Fantastic. Mormon folk magic fighting Cthulhu monsters? I could definitely get behind that. That sounds fantastic. The, the best thing is also they have their ground team 
um, it, are, are missionaries. They're tracking teams. So they at one point have to track down someone. So they tracked door to door and they have it all divided up so they can get through the whole city. It's hilarious. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Uh, Nathaniel, what's your recommendation for us this time? Well, I, I missed the memo on the uh, the time travel theme. Um, and actually, I went with a nonfiction one this time. I just finished reading Grant um, by Ron Chernow. Um, he's the guy who wrote the uh, Hamilton biography that inspired the musical. Um, and Grant was absolutely fantastic. It was incredible. Um, I grew up in the South, uh, and I got a slightly different version of history. Um, didn't realize kind of how different it was in some subtle ways until reading um, this this uh, biography of Grant. Um, it made me tear up multiple times, especially the very beginning and end of the book. Um, I can't talk about the details without getting emotional, but Grant is now my, my personal hero, um, and this book was just incredible. And to be clear, you're talking about like Ulysses S. Grant, not like Heber J. Grant, right? Yes. <laughs> be pretty epic if you had like a biography just called grant heber j right like not the one you thought right like that'd, that'd be amazing ben what's your uh, recommendation for us this time this is super awkward because i didn't i mean and no no offense to you nathaniel the one person that i apparently don't like as much uh no it's actually the book by his dad uh that i'm really enjoying but i didn't know that you were going to be on the podcast because now it's just mildly awkward um, it's the Deseret Book um, book called Faith and Intellect. Let's talk about Faith and Intellect. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll, I'll, I'll be able to, to send him an email interview about it. It is rare to find somebody who can tackle the problem of evil without sounding like a doofus or without sounding like a know-it-all. And he manages to do it with both humility and empathy and grace. And also without, without apologizing, without saying, hey, look, it's really hard. We don't have all the answers. Like, it didn't feel like that kind of a book. It was like, hey, this is hard. I don't have all the answers, but there are some answers that we have that are actually quite compelling. It felt, it was just really, really nice to read something. It felt like a breath of fresh air. So I'm about 75% of the way through it. That is not uh, fiction at all. It was, it was, it was really, really good though. I'm enjoying it. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Given the uh, apparent emerging theme of time travel from our recommendations, when Nathaniel said he had a recommendation that was uh, that was nonfiction, I thought, ooh, this is going to be exciting. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's not where it went. Uh, all right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our conversation uh, talking about the Atom Project. Uh, I just want to go around uh, the table, so to speak, and get some basic reactions. I'll, I'll give you mine. Uh, I enjoyed it. I was the one who first sort of suggested this to the to the group, and I thought it was heartfelt. It was fun. Uh, some of the the aspects were a little like the villain. I thought was a little sort of a stock character, but she's really there so they can have these wonderful moments between the future Adam and his younger self and his dad, who spoilers of course uh, have passed away sometime uh, in in young Adam's past. And even a really, really touching moment between the elder Adam and his mother, who was dealing with all the fallout from the death of the father. So there was some really fun and heartfelt moments, and I, and I like the whole thing. Uh, but I want people's uh, general impression. But as you go around, I also want to ask you each individually, do you have a plan or a password or an identifying marker so that if you do have to travel back in time and talk to your younger self, you can prove to that person that you are actually you from the future. So with those two things in mind, what are your general thoughts? <laughs> uh, how about you, I Ben? I have never thought about putting together a plan. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, 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 Nathaniel, go for it. I was, I was just like in my head processing. Like, I don't think it would take much for future me. Like, I think younger me would be like, oh, it's this guy. Like, I don't think we would need communicate much like I, i've got i've got enough quirks like my mannerisms are are, are pretty thick uh, i loved it i thought it was great uh, it was classic ryan reynolds and he did a great job um there's some things about ryan reynolds that are i don't know how to say this with really impressive actors they have a, almost like a gravitational pull on the entire movie right so like a tom cruise movie will always feel like a tom cruise movie this felt like a ryan reynolds movie and i don't say that as a bad thing but it's very much his personality that's kind of driving things um and I think that's really good. I think I could I could also get tired of it if I watch a lot of his stuff over and over again. There's a there's a humor that is very unique to him. There's um, some tropes that are that are very much his. Kids cursing a lot and just being kind of snarky is kind of that that felt very Ryan, Ryan Reynoldsy. Um, 
but the overall theme I thought was really both fun. And I, I like what you said, Carl, I felt, I felt that there was a lot of it that was just a little bit sci-fi shallow. I'm used to the really, really deep sci-fi stuff. That's the stuff that I like. And it definitely felt like they were cutting corners on, on that, but that's because that's not really what the story was about and that's okay. Right. And so it was, let's just make time travel. The one thing that I will say though, that, um, would have really bothered me, but they did nicely is they, they didn't even make rules. They, they said to the audience, don't worry, we made rules. Don't think about it too much. Right. Like, it, these aren't Brandon Sanderson hard and fast, like the rules matter a lot. It was just like, we've done our, there, there's one scene where he's like, no, that doesn't work. It's when, when I get back, that's when everything goes through. So it's fine for now. Just don't worry about it. It was a throwaway line, but it was enough to communicate to the, to the listener. I care enough about your intelligence, not to insult you. No, we don't think you're stupid. This is just not really the point of this movie. The point of this movie is a relationship between a dad and a son and a man and his wife. And like, that's what this is about. And that worked for me. That was, that was totally fine. Yeah, I have to say, when, when Carl first uh, brought this up as a possible episode, I was kind of hesitant. I was like, oh, I don't know if that movie was good enough like to really discuss. Um, but watching it again for the podcast, um, I felt I, I got the same thing that Ben got out of this. Like The sci-fi aspects are really shallow and not that great um, and kind of stock, but the family dynamics are spot on and that's what makes the movie compelling um if you're in it for the sci-fi part not worth it so interestingly ben brings up like that ryan reynolds has sort of a shtick and we're used to that and i say the moment we met young adam and he was talking back to the bully and i was and, and in my mind i thought oh that is absolutely ryan reynolds dialogue but it sounds weird coming from this other like 13 year old actor or whatever but that's totally ryan reynolds dialogue uh, interestingly, the movie was originally supposed to star Tom Cruise, and I think we all agree that would have been a very different movie, but anyway, at least that's what Wikipedia tells me. It kind of went into development hell for a couple of years and things like that, and then it ended up being done by, by Ryan Reynolds and Sean Levy, so we got this, I thought, delightful movie. Anyway, but what a, what a different timeline that would be, so to speak, if Tom, if Tom Cruise had ended up starring in that. It would just be a very different movie. It would have been a lot more Polar Express, which, hmm. Right, sure. <laughs> I want to see Tom Hanks star in this movie now. <laughs> like... Nathaniel, what were your general thoughts about the movie? Um, I had a little bit more problem with the story, even though that wasn't the point. It wasn't really the the time travel stuff because i agree with ben they kind of just were like don't worry about it too much it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense um the moments that were good were so good that i it, i just felt like it had a ton of heart and so i liked it a lot i enjoyed it a lot um but there were just plot elements that i felt were tropes that they could have done something with like don't wreck the timeline but they didn't actually give any sense of like what's going to happen like catastrophic things could happen but they they were never shown or described. It was just like, here's a plot point. I, I, I didn't really like that. That was like the biggest one for me. Um, and then just some of the scenes, I don't know, like some of it was just a little too sentimental for me um, without really being connected to the story. It was like, here's a really cute, nice, heartwarming, sentimental scene. And back to the movie. Like they, they just didn't tie it together enough for me, but I, I still thought the scenes were, most of them were really, really good. So I liked it in general. I think those are all fair criticisms of the, the movie. To me, the movie that it most seems relatable to as far as like sort of a science fiction take on family might be Interstellar, where they really did the science fiction very, very well. Uh, and then the with the family dynamics as well, with the dad not aging for hundreds of years because of all the wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff going on. Uh, so... That might be a point of comparison on a science fiction family dynamic movie, but uh, very different. Uh... Forgive me if I'm, I'm not supposed to be jumping in. Can I ask a question about this? Sure. It's There's this trope, and I know where it comes from, because like we've done time travel movies since Star Trek in the 60s and you know all of that stuff. But there's this idea that it's, it's so funny to me how powerful these shows are, because there's like an understanding. like We all have it that there's a temporal prime directive, right? You cannot mess up the continuum. That is like deep in our psyche because of shows that were like, yeah, we probably wouldn't want people going back and like killing baby Hitler. Right. And now because of that, that's like deeply ingrained. 
I, I don't think we've actually thought that deeply about it. Like, I'm not convinced that, like, yes, it randomizes things and it could cause problems, but we have no idea. Like, I think we overstate the butterfly effect just a little bit. It's also possible that we just kill baby Hitler and life is better off and it isn't actually as bad as we think, right? That like maybe telling the guy, so, so, and here's, here's my, ah, shoot, what's the name of it? There was this great comparison film and now I can't remember what it was. I'll look it up in just a second. Um, but the, the dad and the son, it's very similar, but they can talk by radio. Oh, frequency. It's frequency. That's the one. Yes. And I loved it. I thought it was great, but it's very much the opposite. They were like, Hey dad, you're going to die. So you're going to do this instead. So you don't die. And it's like the whole movie, he's like trying to help him through. And it was actually just a really charming movie. Like I thought it was great. So I don't, I'm not totally convinced. Like, I, I think it's very much like we have to respect the sacred timeline. And it, it, it just kind of used it as a trope without going into why. So if you're familiar with all of that background, then like you can kind of buy it. But it, I, I think it was telling a story that I liked, which was like, there are more important things right? That like, I can, I can live with you right now. And I may not have always, but I have this moment. And I thought that was really special. But at the end of the day, it was just kind of like, why not try to save him? Why not try to help him? Why not? Like, why, why can't we have that conversation? It just, it just felt like it was a little bit shallow on that side. I thought that was actually an interesting choice not to have, because I initially going through the film thought that the car crash that the dad dies in was going to be not an accident, da da da. It was caused by the the villain lady, right? But it ends up being totally unrelated. Um, I actually kind of liked that choice that we don't solve everything with time travel. Um, Because you could have made this a high concept film with like, we could start in the timeline before Sorian went back in time and got all her money to fund the time travel research and took over and show that timeline and then show her corrupting it and show how Adam changed as a result of that different things. You could have made that high concept film, but then the logical conclusion of that film is we're going to fix everything with time travel. So your dad doesn't die. And so we don't have to deal with grief, um, which is the, the movie is about dealing with grief and, and hard things happening. Um, especially when Adam is willing to let his wife die again, right. To save him with no indication, whether he's going to be able to save her in the future and meet her in the future. Like he's giving up the chance to meet her as well as the chance to be with her right now. I watched another time travel movie about the same time I watched Adam projects. I had to actually go rewatch Adam project before this podcast, because I was getting the plots of the two movies confused. Um, the one I watched was boss level on Hulu I mean, it had like the same, like, you know, the world will end if we mess this up, but it actually showed it. And so like, to me, that was like much more powerful because it was like, here are the stakes. And I think that comparison is why I was frustrated by Adam Project, where it's just like, don't cross the streams or bad things will happen. Trust us. And it's just, it wouldn't have been that hard. I think a couple lines of dialogue to make something just a little bit better but you know it's true it wasn't that kind of movie i also i'm spoiled from reading too many science fiction books and when you read science fiction takes on time travel they can get into all these details a, a lot better and so like i can go through like here are the genre and subgenre of time travel you know you get the multiverse you've got the one timeline that heals itself and then you've got block time which i think is the most interesting um and I don't know. So it's kind of hard to make a time travel movie for somebody who reads a bunch of time travel books because you're not going to get the same level of detail in a movie that you can get in a book. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> to answer your original question, sort of, Ben, about where does this trope come from, I actually think it predates Star Trek because I think it started with Doctor Who in the 50s. Uh, one of my favorite episodes from the very first Doctor is where they go back in time to the Aztecs. And one of the doctor's companions says, if this is kind of a, a moment for their society, if we could fix it so they're not like a bunch of uh, human sacrificing, you know, stock villain characters, when the conquistadors show up, they won't be inclined to murder all the Aztecs. And we will see a very different world emerge from that because these are most of these people here are wonderful and, and generous and kind and they've been really good to us and and the doctor in a moment of amazing acting that I really enjoyed and kind of have missed in every doctor that I've seen since 
just lays into her about the catastrophic consequences of messing too much with the timeline. So I think it comes from Doctor Who. Um, there is a really interesting episode of Star Trek Voyager where they're kind of fighting against a guy who has a time travel ship who keeps going back in time to try to fix his wife's death and keeps screwing the timeline up over and over and over and over again. And Janeway and company finally convince him that like he's doing too much damage to other people in the quest for his own personal happiness and to let it go, which is kind of why I appreciated the Adam project uh, to bring all these threads together, because there's something very Buddhist about the Adam project. Very like we, we, you could have made a, a more high concept movie more about time travel where you could fix the timeline, so to speak, and get your father back. But it wouldn't have had the same emotional effect and, and wouldn't have had the same sort of thing and would have changed the thesis of the movie in ways that I think would have been uh, less interesting and certainly not as, as heartfelt. The scene at the end where the three of them are playing catch and then he overthrows the ball and his dad turns around to go pick it up from the bush. And I'm like, Oh, there it is. And yep, they were gone. And it was just a nice moment to say, like, what would you do if you had one last day with your father? One last hour is is a question worth exploring, even if maybe with time travel sorts of things, you could say, no, what if you just made your dad live and, uh, die, you know, and died of old age like he's like we think he's supposed to. Yeah, but they could have just given him cancer. Like, and then, like, what are you going to do about cancer? Like, you can't yeah, fix Cancer it. wouldn't have had the red herring of the is the car crash part of this. And it wouldn't have been like just begging you to be like, hey, you get into a car accident on this date at this time. Be careful. We're done. How does this be like some that's not a huge impact on the timeline, not at all compared to what they're doing. And so you're just left with this like, you know, it's like something stuck in your tooth. Like, what? this is too easy. Like, and it would be so simple to get to the same point in a way that's not going to make people constantly being like, but why don't they just talk about it? Like, again, a cancer diagnosis, he could already have cancer. It's too late. He doesn't know yet. There's nothing they can do about it. And you would even have like the, do we tell him or do we not? Because if we tell him, then, you know, it could make his time work. Like you could have hit all the same beats with none of the baggage with that one little slight change. Well, and I'll, I'll add to that. There's, there's the old saying, if, if in Act 1 there's a rifle on the wall, if it's not shot by Act 4, you shouldn't have the rifle. Chekhov's gun, yeah. Right? I, it's something, you know, I'm sure I butchered it, but you get the idea, right? No, yes. It, that's it. It just has a name. <laughs> it actually has a name. That's even better. Chekhov's gun. Mm -hmm. Why I'm glad that I'm around friends who actually, like, read, and I don't. Um, I think that the same is true of the villain, right? That, like, I think that they did a great job and I would call it an eight out of 10 movie. Like it was fun. I enjoyed it. There was a little more cursing than I'm ready for, for my kids. Cause they're so tender, but like good movie. I enjoyed it. It was fun. It wouldn't have been hard to make a better villain. You introduce her at the beginning as somebody that everybody trusts. It's not that hard to have her be like the godmother or, you know, have a couple of lines of dialogue. You just have to craft it better. One of the things I'm starting to realize about the movies that I love, like not the movies that I like, I enjoyed this one but the movies that I want to show friends that like, I have to buy my own copy of those things that we used to call DVDs, right? The ones that I'm willing to go all out for are that they're just crafted really, really well. The people have thought through all of things and have ironed all of the kinks out. Um, there are kinks in this movie. I was about to say it's a kinky movie. That's not what I mean, Ryan Reynolds, no. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> but it is, <laughs> it's, it's a very, like there's, there's plot holes. And I think what's nice is that the movie doesn't take itself so seriously that it matters that much. Like, it's not trying to be Lord of the Rings, right? It's not trying to have it all worked out. You can kind of get what it's get going for and just let your mind relax and not worry about it so much. Yeah. So let's talk about the cursing, though, because we watched this for family movie night with my 13 through 6-year-olds. And I, oh, I was not expecting, yeah, the amount of cursing that was going on in this movie. And just also, like, the awkward raunchiness of him talking with his teenage self and there's lots of sexual innuendo jokes. And this, I mean, this film is crying out for a, a vid angel, right? Where you can just, if you, those add nothing. They literally add nothing. Well, I want to interrupt you and say that they did add one thing. It felt like a Ryan Reynolds movie, right? Like, I think that's. Granted, I don't know if I'm just too sensitive, but I just do not like 
that kind of humor at all. Well, and I'm, I'm also happy. So it's interesting after, after my wife and I watched it, she turned to me and said, you know, it's interesting. Like the Ryan Reynolds, his mom and dad had kids, but he and his wife don't. And they're in their forties. And it just feels like it's kind of no, like the Ryan and Blake Lively had, they have three kids. No, 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 no. In the movie. In the movie. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. In real life, they do. Well, so that's kind of what's funny to me is like, wouldn't Ryan Reynolds have a son by this point? And if he does, then what's going on there? And like, there were just a lot of things like that where it's like, what's this? What's this? Like, I mean, I don't even remember the cuss words. Um, I'm just not as sensitive to that. Uh, and I actually did not find it raunchy um, for the situation and the age of the characters. I thought it was moderate, like at most. Um, but I was watching it. You know, I watched it for family movie night as well. But my kids, um, well, I have, I have young kids that don't watch it with us because they're one and three, and that's way too young. And then I have teenagers, and so with my teenagers, I didn't really bat an eye through it. So it didn't bother me, and it didn't seem excessive. It fit the character. I think it was mostly the conversation about his younger self asking if he ever gets to have sex, and like this, they keep returning to this, and like. Yes, like it is showing his younger self, who's a very bullied, picked on, not very likable middle school crappy kid, um, that his life does get better, right? Is that the only way that his life gets better? Like, is that the, I don't know. I'm, I was not a teenage boy, so maybe it's unrealistic to me, but maybe that's just me. It didn't strike me as unrealistic or obsessed. Like it would be pretty natural, I think, for a kid that age to ask something like that. Um, and I don't know. I, I actually thought there's a lot of directions they could have taken that that they didn't. <laughs> like from my perspective, it was actually pretty restrained. Like um, Ryan Reynolds basically refuses to talk about it, which is definitely not the route they could have taken. So you get kind of a curious kid asking socially awkward, inappropriate questions that are kind of age appropriate. And then Ryan Reynolds refusing to answer them, just like he refuses to let him drink. So I don't know if anything for me, the message was kind of okay like because he's not being indulged in it um i don't know it, again it just it didn't it didn't ruffle my feathers i i feel like to me there was the, there was like the crassness of it but i think that there were there were two redeeming qualities and two things that bothered me the, the crassness bothered me the redeeming qualities were there was some authenticity there of like if i saw my future self you better believe i'm gonna ask like you know what job am i gonna have and like just all of the you know the, it was it was a very like ryan reynolds funny and then i think the second part was that it was funny it was meant to be very very funny the part that bothered me, though, was just this, like, grumpy kid who's bullied and picked on. It's just kind of been done, right? Like, it, it, it kind of falls into this, like, I, I've been thinking a lot about masculinity and toxic masculinity in, in particular because I've been writing on it. And it just feels like we sometimes, I don't think that we mean to, but we're perpetuating this story about about boys where it's like, why, why can't he actually be fine with life? Why can't, like, yeah, okay, he gets bullied, that's fine, but he doesn't have to, like, check every single box of every teenage boy trope that we've ever heard like there's another way to do that and i think ryan reynolds could have made it funny and also said hey bucko there you know, like you're gonna be just fine also like you know like, like have a father-son moment almost and like give him give him a really good example instead of just joking about it i i don't know i think that was the second part take the crassness out right if you bid angel up you keep the scene I think that there was an opportunity there for some maturity and some like still some lightheartedness and something funny, but that handled it really well. Like that I would want my, my son to see like, like a, a father son, like, Hey, let's, let's actually take this meaningfully for a second. Here's the advice I'm going to give you. you. You don't need to worry about it. You're going to be just fine. Right. Something like, I, I don't know how you do that. That takes a little bit better writing than I have off the cuff. I mean, I think they handled that pretty well honestly like when he tells him to get in the fight and you're like oh he's gonna do the father figure it you know help him fight thing and then he loses spectacularly and ryan reynolds isn't like oh my plan failed I, I meant to help you and i overestimated your abilities or something he's just like you getting repeatedly beat up is what turns you into the person you need to become so no i i threw you into that knowing you were going to lose and I thought that was a legitimate message, um, especially because it's not his dad, it's himself. Um, but also, I just really, really identified with um, little Ryan Reynolds in this because when I was in middle school, I was very, very, very short. Um, 
and I mouthed off a lot, especially to bullies, like constantly. Um, and so I don't know, it didn't strike me as generic because I was like, oh, that's me. And I don't usually see myself in movies, but like the combination of like inability to be physically intimidating, but also just completely unwilling to shut up, like, especially when it comes to bullies, less so with parents. Like I was like, oh yeah, that's me. I don't know. It didn't seem too generic, but that might just be, you know, everybody likes to see themselves representation. Just to just so all three of us gang up on Liz on this point, I also don't think it unreasonable that a teenage boy would ask his future I would ask his future self that specific question. It, it may also just be like I was a super prudish teenager. I've been a grandmother since I was thirteen, so sure. <laughs> Um, but and it is different. I would not recommend like your kids. You say are six to thirteen. I I don't know that I would recommend this for that age group. Um, it's a it's a PG thirteen movie, and I think we do a terrible job as a society now of waiting until kids are roughly thirteen to show them PG thirteen movies. I still remember watching Kindergarten Cop when I was twelve and going, no, I think I'm old enough to watch a PG thirteen movie. And and it was like a, a little moment of me of deciding I was mature enough to do that. And I don't know, that's I feel like we've lost something there as as a society. But I wanted to jump off a, a sort of Ben's point that there's this nice father son moment, although between, you know, the older Adam time traveling back to talk to his younger self. But I thought there were some really sweet moments between the two of them and their actual father. The quote that I really liked was where it's sort of the moment of, dare I say, atonement between especially the elder um, Adam and his father, where the father says, you're my boys and you'll always be my boys through all time. And and the healing that that sh that shows on Ryan Reynolds face when they have this moment of of reconciliation and how he was angry at his dad not justifiably he they pointed out he's angry at his dad for dying because being angry at something is easier in in the dialogue they say than uh than really dealing with grief in like a healthy way. It's the, it's the easier path, right? Anger, fear, aggression, the dark side, are they uh, quick, qu quick to, uh, what does Yoda say, right? Like qu quick to join a fight, but uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and I truly like that. And it reminded me if, if I can, um, one of my favorite books of the past couple of years has been educated by Tara Westover. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Uh, there's a moment in, in it where Tara is talking to her mother about the abusive situation she grew up in. I guess spoilers for Educated as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> go read and, it anyway. Right, you should go read it anyway. Uh, and, and her mother basically says, yes, I remember all these terrible things happening to her. And then Tara has this really unique moment that I want to just read this paragraph if I could. Uh her mother, t they're, they're in a, they're, they're chatting like over AOL instant messenger or, you know, Google chat or something like that. Her mother writes, you were my child. I should have protected you. And then Tara writes, I lived a lifetime in the moment I read those lines, a life that was not the one I had actually lived. I became a different person who remembered a different childhood. I didn't understand the magic of those words then. And I don't understand it now. I know only this, that when my mother told me she had not been the mother to me that she wished she'd been, she became that mother for the first time. I love you, I wrote, and I closed my laptop. Now that's on page 272 for anybody who wants to follow along. And the moment between uh, the two Adams and their dad reminded me of that where, where a sincere apology and a healing moment can occur and undo so much of what has come in the past. And I really like that. Uh, also kind of goes into a the, the, the theme of the movie that talks about how you remember your past sort of in the way you want to. How the older Adam is like, oh, dad got me that stupid ball pitch thing so that he wouldn't have to 
you know, throw ball with me in the backyard. And the younger Adam says, no, he came every day and did that. He bought that. Yes. But, but he, he, and, and they just have very, it was because good... I'd wanted it so bad that he finally got it for me. Right. Right. And, and it becomes this interesting commentary on memory and the way our current emotions shape our past uh, thoughts. So I don't know. I like that. Anybody want to riff off? That was my favorite moment in the film, that conversation actually, Um, because I don't think we acknowledge enough that our attitude colors our memories of our childhood, especially. Um, I know my siblings and I have this one very traumatic memory that me and my sister, my brother remember differently. Um, It's about a deleted file on a Zelda game. And who deleted whose file and destroyed someone's progress and they were totally traumatized. Like we all remember being the victim in that situation and nobody like they don't match in any way. Um, And a lot of movies take for granted that we remember our childhood perfectly. And that's just not accurate. Like our memories of the past are colored by our beliefs currently. And when your beliefs change, that can change the way you see the past. And so Adam's, memories of his childhood have been colored by this anger that his father died, that he wants to make everything that happened in his childhood bad. He, he hasn't accepted that and moved on and he doesn't love those memories like he could if he got over it. Um, if he dealt with that grief and accepted it. This is another reason you should read educated because she, as a trained Oxford historian goes through her abusive past with that lens of, of how do you figure out history and has some really interesting, the footnotes of the book are really interesting actually. But uh, yeah. Anybody else want to jump in, Ben? I'm, I'm happy to add my amen. So I was, I was actually going to say that. So when I was watching the interaction between him and his mom, I was really worried they were going to do something weird where like, there's like tension there. He asked her on a date and I was like, please don't, please. That's not funny. That's not a good joke. Like don't. And they didn't. Um, and instead, I think they actually got that part. They got him and his mom really like good. I'd say like eight, nine out of 10. I think they got him and himself talking about his dad, like 10 out of 10. That was the part of the movie that actually moved me the most. Um, I think I, I, I want to add one thought, and this is like a deeper philosophical kind of a thought. I have friends who have been through absolute hell, like actual legitimate, like really crazy awfulness. Um, because of or 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 because of the neglect of their parents i also have people who think that they have had the worst parents in the world but honestly have had pretty okay pretty decent parents but have just kind of talked themselves into how awful their parents are and i think that that was what spoke to me about this movie is like look I'm, i'm not here to judge other people's experience i can't i'm not smart enough but i i suspect that one of the things we're going to see in 10 20 30 years is a lot of people turning around and pointing the finger at their parents and saying, well, you, you didn't do, and you already see this a little bit on Twitter where it's like, well, I was traumatized. Your dad grounded you. Like that's, that's not trauma. Like let's, let's, let's have the conversation well and deliberately here. Um, and at the same time, like trauma doesn't always necessarily mean like abuse with a capital A, right? Like, like there, there are some parents out there that, that are, that need to do better. And it's so hard because there's no way to, to, to navigate that well. I think that this was a really thoughtful way of saying like, Hey, a lot of parents are trying their best and, and have the conversation with yourself about what, about what, what your parents are actually trying to accomplish and what they're trying to do. I I found it really meaningful that the young self is talking to the old self and saying, no, no. Um, he actually does care about you. He, he does, he does love you. He does care about you. He, he bought that for you. That was, a very poignant moment. And then he has to figure that piece out for himself. So short version, I, I think that's probably the strongest emotional arc of the film. I think the scene that really hammers this home though, and I agree that was like the pinnacle of, of the movie, but the scene that I like so much um, is the father talking to the mother and kind of asking like, am I a bad father? And she's like, no, but you're not perfect either. And that's kind of what I love that made this the story of every family where we're not doing a cartoon thing where like the plot is the dad messed up and he needs to learn a lesson. And we're not doing a cartoon thing where the plot is, you know, Ryan Reynolds messed up and he turned his dad into a villain, but really his dad is a hero. The plot is these are all pretty decent people going through a lot of pain, 
all of them have things that they could do to improve and be better. Um, and that's why the redemption at the end um, where the father is, you know, saying, telling his boys how much he loves them is so meaningful because it's not the, you know, I, I've realized the error of my ways. I was a terrible father. It's just, I was an imperfect father. Um, and if I've got one last chance to say something to my boys, this is it. And that is something that every parent can relate to. And it made it so universal. And like the family dynamics in this movie are like 11 out of 10. The time travel is like six out of 10, maybe. Um, the, the family dynamics are definitely 11 out of 10 and you need all those pieces. Right. And it's just, it's just incredible. Those, those scenes, like the, those three or four that we've talked about are just like epically awesome. Well, can, can I also just mention Bruce Banner as dad? Like, like my mind the entire time was like, don't make him angry. Don't make him angry. Right. Like, like, I feel bad for people who are totally not typecast, but are kind of totally typecast and it's not their fault. Um, oh, but I, one of the reviews I read pointed out that um, him and the mom were also a couple in 30 going or 13 going on 30. So this is like a sequel. Oh, that's funny. I didn't even, I didn't even piece that together. Um, I think the other thing, so, so you, I think you nailed it, Nathaniel. Um, what I was going to add to that now, shoot, let me see if I can remember it. Um, I think the, the the one that resonated with me a lot was when when the dad goes home and like, no, I'm going to cook dinner. I'm going to spend time with my family. I am going to stay home with my kids. I need to be here with my kids right now. And it's like this clear overcorrection out of like, oh, crap, I don't have much time. I don't know how much time I have, but I know it's limited. I need to do everything I can. And like, and then she says, no, you're not perfect. You're weird and you're quirky and your cooking is is an offense against humanity. But you care about our kids and you're trying. And like that, that was not just heartwarming, but like, I, I hate it when it's it, like, when I watched um, Incredibles, I love the Incredibles. It's a great movie, but it's like very clearly built for dads to watch, right? Like the main character is not the kid, right? Like we, we all know this. And so they're not, they're not even being sneaky. That one hit me totally off guard. When I'm watching um, Bruce Banner, and I can't even remember the actor's name. When I'm watching him, um, what's his name? Now I can't remember. Mark Ruffalo, thank you. When I'm watching Mark Ruffalo and he is like, I want to be better. Um, it just like hit me like a ton of bricks because it was, I, I didn't think it was about him. He wasn't in the movie for the first half. Like you don't get to know him. You don't get to see him. And then out of nowhere, it's like this person that you've barely met, just, just feeling this very, very normal dad feeling that to me was, was pretty, pretty incredible. The line is, uh, from from Jennifer Garner's character to Mark Ruffalo's character, is, from the mom to the dad, he doesn't need perfect, he needs you. And that was a fantastic, I think, I don't know if that's the thesis of the movie, but it's certainly one of the major themes of the movie. And I liked it uh, a lot. Uh, I wanted to make sure we got Liz to talk a little bit about the scene between older Adam and his mom in the bar, where there, he, she's really like down on herself because she knows that she's not doing real well by her son because of, of she's not processing her grief well and he has this nice moment where he talks to her so i don't know as a mother of teenage sons i wanted to get your thoughts definitely like that's the one that makes me cry right like um the older version of her son telling you no he he still loves you he's he's gonna come back around um, teenage boys are dumb and they say dumb things to their mom because they know they can, um, because they know you'll still love them. And I think that's an important perspective for parents of teenagers to, to hold on to because teenagers are jerks. <laughs> I tell this to my kids all the time, like, yeah, teenagers are dumb. You'll, you'll thank me later for making you shower more than twice a week. Sorry. I'm going to make you do it. I don't care if you tell me you hate me because I did that to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's kind of almost a wish fulfillment scene, but I think it's handled really well. Um, it, do, it doesn't go over the line of being too maudlin, but just kind of like, it's okay, mom. It's hard. And, and like Ben, I was a little worried they were going to try to do something goofy with it, but I was really glad that they completely did not. Uh, and it just was one of, I think, I think that was my favorite part of the, uh, of the movie. Cause it was just a nice little moment. And with the dad and the two Adams, maybe some of the time travel stuff seeps into my enjoyment of that a little bit. Uh, cause of the, cause of the six out of 10 time travel theory versus the 10 out of 10, uh, parental child dynamics. Yeah. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I also like that in the bar scene, um, Ryan Reynolds actually had something to tell her that was like concrete. I think that's one of the things that rescued it from being like overly sentimental. It wasn't just sharing. Um, and I thought it was just so insightful. Like the problem with acting like you've got it all together is that a kid might actually believe it. Um, so maybe let him know that you're struggling too. And I thought that was like actually insightful and very practical. Um, it really drove the scene forward, I thought. And it was also just, you know, it kind of elevated it from like really nice sentiment to like, oh yeah, so thought for provoking as well. Yeah. I think some of my best parenting moments are the moments I apologize to my daughter for something I've done. For sure. They're very humbling moments. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's really important to let your kids know that you're not perfect, that you don't have it all together and apologize for those. And then hopefully they will follow your example and apologize when they're being a stupid teenager. <laughs> I think it also is just so helpful because then they know how much effort you're putting into it. Because if you never apologize, they get the impression that like you're doing exactly what you want to all the time, which can also give the impression that it's easy. When you apologize, part of what you're really conveying is this isn't easy and I'm trying really hard. I'm at the limits of my capacity. Um, and even when they're young, that's not going to sink in all at once. But I think even at a young age, it really makes an impression and they understand that this is something that you're putting effort into. Um, because people who try hard make mistakes. You know, the only people who never make mistakes, generally speaking, are people who aren't really trying that hard. They're operating well within their capacity. So I think that's really important. I think one of the one of the thoughts that came to mind as I was watching this is there's some some good uh, evidence, or at least I should say that it's the common wisdom among the people that I respect the most that it's better not to fight in front of your kids. But it's actually a lot more important that if you do fight in front of the kids, you also show yourselves um, figuring it out again in front of the kids. Because otherwise they see the fight and they don't see the like the coming back together and the restitution. I feel like it's so easy to just paint all of family stuff as messy and hard and like it's it's a it's a weight around the neck and, and who would want to do this? And I hate that message. At the same time, it also can just look so perfectly clean that everybody's rolling their eyes and going, I don't, I don't th this isn't me. This doesn't resonate with me. I think what was nice about this was that it was just a very normal family trying really hard, caring about each other and not being super great at expressing how and why and messing up left and right. And at the, it's, it's, it's kind of an, a perfectly imperfect kind of a feeling, right? Like, and I think, I think that's why it's so meaningful when old Ryan Reynolds looks around and goes, oh, I get it. Like he actually does care about me. And that, that, that healing moment, I think, um, really allows him to move on. I, I think that the other thing is, um, I've thought for a while, so I don't know if you remember um, Mrs. Doubtfire, when I watched it when I was a kid, great show, right? Like Robin Williams at his peak, like just just such a funny movie. And I did not realize at the time that it's actually like totally 100% a great movie to show a kid who's going through a divorce, right? Like it's like, I, I, I don't know if I would say great. I would ask a, a family therapist before I, before I would show a kid. But like it's trying to grapple with this hard thing. And there's some parts at the end where it's like, oh, no, they still love each other. It's just hard. I think that this is one of those where it's like, hey, you don't need to be mad at your dad because he died right? Like, I'm sorry that he died, but that anger, like that frustration you feel, maybe it's because he's not there and you actually really do love him. And that's okay. Like it's, it's sneaky therapy in a way that I was okay with that deeper message. I, I resonated with me. So there was one final point I wanted to sort of just, uh, get y'all's thoughts on, uh, which was the villain who, although very sort of stock, villain like haha i'm gonna go back in time and change the timeline so i become like an evil version of elon musk and take over the world and and make it make it like terminator 2 future on a bad on, on a good day which that seems pretty horribly dystopian to me i don't i don't know if you could create uh there would be an academy where you could learn to be a time travel pilot in that kind of future but you know what do i know uh it's a throwaway line but she says a line when she talks to her past self where she says, I fixed the future where we had been forgotten. And it's, it's sort of an interesting juxtaposition with her uh, who thinks an important legacy is to make sure that her company is really rich and that she controls the timeline and, and she does all these unethical things to make sure that she can pay off the senators in the future when she needs to. And I don't know, the, the whole scheme is a little fuzzy because she's just a stock villain. And again, it's not the point of the care of the, of the, the, it's not the point of the movie, but she, that was an interesting sort of contrast with the family, that the family matters more to the rest of them. 
Like the reason he's gone back in time is not to save the world. He went back in time to save his wife. Like that's the whole reason. Um, and so, yeah, the motivation gap there. I don't know why we keep you keep ragging on the villain. I actually thought it, she was a perfectly good villain for this movie. Like, like she doesn't have a big role. And given that she doesn't have a big role, I was actually surprised that they gave her a pretty substantial plot arc. Like the fact that she clearly, the younger self is much more idealistic. Um, and so they have like an actual, I thought for the time they spent on her, which was the right amount of time. Cause she's not a central character for the amount of time they spent on her. I thought she was the opposite of a stock villain. Like I, I it got me thinking and it was just like a, a surprisingly well-drawn villain where you could clearly see this is where she started and she's flawed because she's listening to her future self. She's following the advice. And in that first con, you know, how dare you ask me to do all these things, but you did them, didn't you? And it's like, oh, well, there's your fatal flaw. And you can see that if, you know, you, you, you pontificate about, well, this is unethical. How dare you ask me to do all these things? Well, you did them, didn't you? Then, then over time, if you do these things, no matter how reluctantly, this is what you become. Um, so I actually thought it was a, it was, it was, it was a remarkably good um, villain. Um, I have to say the moment when they take her out is like a stand up and cheer moment for every nerd parent out there where she gets destroyed by her own lack of understanding of the science behind this technology she's exploiting. Like, Except like, that it makes yes, no sense. Kids be nerds. Because the bullet would have had the same pull inside the gun. She's like holding the gun the same distance away. No yeah, reaction. Yeah. Don't think too hard about then it. Then she fires <laughs> the gun and like all of a sudden it's got like a thousand G's of force pulling. Like, Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. No, bad, bad sci-fi, but like the line where it's like, you never understood the science was like, yeah, see kids, the nerds win. That was a very good line. All right. Well, uh, unless anybody has any final thoughts, I think we'd like to move into our ratings segment. Uh, What did you all think of the movie? Our first rating, of course, is for content. Uh, although I'm sympathetic to our guest last time who said that maybe the content versus artistic merit distinction is more artificial than it should be, but we're going to stick with it. Um, celestial, terrestrial, telestial, or outer darkness, where would you all put this one? Sorry, when you say content, we're talking about like cursing and, and cleanliness and for kids. Is that what we mean? Or yeah, we're mean- talking about vid-angelness. <laughs> yeah, vid, vid, right. Vid-angelness, that's right. How many filters is this going to have on vid angel? <laughs> Would you take your grandma to see it? And so for me, I am deeply sympathetic to uh, the idea that that one conversation is maybe a little more raunchy than it could be, even though all three of us uh, guys here are like, nope, yep, checks out. Seems seems good to me. Uh, there is a little too much swearing. I would say uh, for, for a PG-13 movie, this is about what I expect, which means it's probably terrestrial like it could be worse uh but it's certainly not in the celestial category but i don't know i'm open to the possibility i'm wrong what did you all think of it? i think i was just expecting a little less swearing i i guess i'm used to pg-13 mostly being based on violence like for marvel movies and stuff and not on language so i think that's what threw me off we were expecting like time travel fights woohoo but not expecting the language and the more mature conversations that we got. So definitely I, I'm going to agree with you on the terrestrial. Um, don't watch it with a six-year-old <laughs> or an eight-year-old. I'm going with the same rating. I mean, given that it was a PG-13, I'm, I'm going to go with a solid terrestrial. I think we're all in the same place. So for artistic merit, we rate it on a scale of one to five popcorn balls. Uh, I think we've hit on the the differences in the writing between the science fiction aspects, which we all felt were a little lackluster, uh, and the family dynamics, which are the more the point of the movie, which we thought they handled really, really well. Uh, I'm going to say the the action sequences were quite fun. Uh, the little throwaway line, is that a lightsaber? No. Well, yes. <laughs> right. And then he starts like vaporizing people with it. Uh, and then his wife shows up and she's awesome. And the, the, fight scenes between the two spacecraft are fun like that all seemed really fun to me as well uh and so i think i'm gonna give it uh overall four popcorn balls because i think the things it did it did really well uh and the things it didn't do really well weren't the point so i don't care about that as much 
I'd give it four as well, but I'm still grumpy about it because I feel that if they'd really aimed a little higher, it wouldn't have been that hard to make this amazing. Like there are small things. Like I, I think they kind of took your attitude, which is like, ah, we don't have to take it too seriously. And I'm like, that's fine. Like cheesy can be good, but you had such powerful dramatic moments here and that kind of gives the movie a kind of earnestness and a kind of seriousness and you really didn't have to go far out of your way to just tidy up a couple of the sci-fi things just a little bit so that they weren't as distracting and then this could have gone from like yeah fun four to like a classic this could have been a classic Um, and it was within their grasp and they just didn't bother to do it and so four but i'm still really grumpy about it I always wonder if there were maybe, I mean, I don't think there are ever budgetary constraints uh, for, for good writing, but uh, I think of, for example, Ender's game, which ended up being cut short because the company that made Ender's that was making all the, the sort of computer generated ships in space and stuff like went under halfway through their making it. So all the, the I didn't know that. Yeah, so all the all the stuff where he's commanding the armies at the end when he doesn't know he's commanding the armies uh, at the end, all of those scenes were very short and they looked awesome and they were fun. But the whole com- so the command school part only lasted like five ten minutes because they didn't have the budget for it, which I think affected the movie. So I always wonder if there's something like that going on in movies like this as well, even though that maybe doesn't work perfectly. Uh, if we are complaining about some of the writing, but I don't know. Those are always thoughts that I have. The big takeaway here is that I don't need to feel quite so bad that they ruined Ender's Game. And so thank you for that, Carl. I can now make peace with that film. <laughs> uh, You're welcome. I, I, and just so it's, I, I feel guilty now, but I'm, I'm going to steal Nathaniel's. I think it was a four with a lot of potential. And that's almost more frustrating. Like that feels more like a three or a two to me than if it had been like a solid four. Right. Um, I, I think that this, and, and let me, back to my example of frequency, I can't remember most of the details. I can't remember how they figured everything out. It was a lot smoother. It's clear that they didn't like, they, it was very soft magic instead of hard magic, if I can use that term, but it was charming. And you watched it and you went, oh, it's really sweet. And this one you went, oh, that was fun, right? And I think there was a chance to make it into that. Like like uh, there, there was a little bit of like, oh, that was, that was good. I think it could have had some more closure. Yeah, I think I'm going to be a little more pessimistic on it, and I would go with a three, personally. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like it was it was kind of soft pitch to them, this great idea, and they didn't hit it out of the park. It was just fine. It's not going to be one of those super memorable movies for me, so I'm going to go with three. Frequency is a great movie. Maybe that can be like a sort of side recommendation. Uh, it got turned into a TV show on the CW for a couple seasons. I never watched that. I didn't know that. That would might be an interesting thing to revisit sometime, Benjamin. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. And our final rating is a uh, gospel connection, sort of morally uh, edifying messages and things like that. I'm just going to say, I think this one is a five. There are some great conversations to be had. The moments of, of reconciliation between the two Adams and their dad and the, that wonderful scene between the elder Adam and the mom. Uh, they just, there were some really great moments here uh, that, that I thought gave, as we've said, gave the movie a lot of heart and made me think about some things that, uh, the importance of family and how you treat your family and the way you remember things that happened with your family in the past, all were, I think, uh, great themes to have a good conversation about. And I thought they hit all those themes, uh, very well. What do you think? One to five apricot. If I can go out on a limb, I'm going to, uh, sorry to be the pessimist on this one. I'm going to give it a three, but here's my defense. I think like C.S. Lewis's Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is like a four. And when you get to five, like you're basically reading out of the, like, I don't, I don't want everything to be a five, you know? Like, I don't want it to be like overly draped in, in gospelisms, you know, and stuff like that. I love the, the family message. I thought that was great. I think the other one that really struck me was like, you're going to be my voice throughout all time. There was something eternal about that and something deep that resonated. I, I don't think he was like secretly putting in Mormon motifs, right? Like, I, I don't think that was the goal. But I think there was something about that eternal nature of family that just like hit me. I, I, so I guess I would say a three, but like in a way that I'm good with. Like, I'm not sure that I'm aiming for a five. Maybe, maybe I have the scale wrong. So if I do, you can correct me. Um, I wouldn't have wanted much more, 
Um, but I feel I feel like it it was it was right right about where I wanted. I, I have to say that um, the when I was doing uh, research for this episode, if you type in Ryan Reynolds, one of the top few results is is Ryan Reynolds Mormon on Google, which he's not, but <laughs> apparently he gives off the vibe. Poor guy. Once you wear a white shirt and free guy, it's over for you. Like it's that's just how it goes. Um, I I would give it a four. I'll split the difference between you on on moral messages. I really like the family messages um, and the the authenticness. And there's not a clear this person in the family was the problem and needed to change. It was all of us need to keep changing. And and families are hard, and they are also worth it. I'm gonna go the same thing for yeah. All right. So apparently I'm the over, overly optimistic one on the scale, but you know that's all good. It's okay. I'm the grown. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thank you uh, for joining us, everybody. Glad to have you. First of all, before we sign off, uh, you can find me, Carl Cranny. I'm on Twitter at Carl Cranny. Very unoriginal there. Liz, where can people find you? Uh, you can find my writing and book reviews at LizBusby.com. All right. And Nathaniel, if people want to get in touch with you, where could they find you? Uh, Twitter at Nathaniel Givens or NathanielGivens.com. And I apparently need a personal website because I don't have one, uh, but I have a Twitter. I think it's Benjamin Pacini, but I'm Italian. So it's P-A-C-I-N-I. Uh, don't embarrass yourself. It's not Pacini. <laughs> Oh, I guess I also have a podcast. I, I forget that sometimes. You got to pitch your podcast. I have to pitch my podcast, uh, Radical Civility. It's it's uh, that's code for whatever Ben feels like talking about, and we have a fun time. I'm still trying to find a way to cross post one of these episodes, so we need to watch a movie about civility, and then we can like have it be in both streams. I think that would be a lot of fun. Oh, we should. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll be discussing Mirai, a 2018 Japanese anime film involving time travel and family history through the eyes of a four-year-old boy who is jealous of his new baby sister. This film is available to stream on Netflix or to rant on other platforms, so be ready for that conversation next time. This has been Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, encouraging you to seek after everything virtuous, lovely, of good report, or praiseworthy. See you next time. <laughs>